Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. Up front today, we'll be talking to Gregory Bryant, a new recruiter in LSU's high school relations department, as we take a look at the university's efforts to increase black student enrollment. In our one-to-one -one segment, more talk about college as Genevieve Stewart interviews Dr. Norman Francis, president of Xavier University in New Orleans. We close today's show with a look at some of Louisiana's minority criminal justice workers. I'm Rob Hinton, and we'll have those stories today on Folks. Everybody's just folks. Hello everyone and welcome to Folks. How do you get black college-minded high school students to attend a predominantly white university? Well, up front today we'll be searching for an answer to that question as we take a look at what officials at LSU are doing to increase their black student enrollment. LSU first opened its doors back in 1860, but it wasn't until the 1960s that blacks were allowed to attend the university's undergraduate school. LSU's black student enrollment now stands at 7%. But university officials hope to eventually raise that to reflect what it calls a real-world balance. The percentage of black people in Louisiana is about 30 percent. I didn't know that. I didn't think it was quite that high. Maybe. I have to find out. But if it's that high, then we should be trying to come that close to a real-world balance here at LSU. In other words, I think that the you know, experience here should mirror the real world. Uh, I think black people are probably comprise anywhere from 18 to 22 percent of the national population. I think that's realistic. I think the consent decree, while it does establish some very, very demanding and challenging goals or projections, probably isn't too far off in that they would like to see our uh, enrollment of black students as first-time students in 1988 at 18 uh, percent. It's not easy for us, but we're going to keep trying to reach that goal, and so I think the, a viable, realistic percentage of black students at LSU would be about 18 or so percent. But uh, again, it should try to mirror the real world. Gregory Bryan is a new recruiter in LSU's high school relations department. He travels throughout the state urging black high school students interested in attending college to take a look at LSU. Whenever I talk to people about uh, LSU and its intention and uh, uh, efforts to increase the number of black students here at LSU. Uh, one thing impresses me, and I like to tell people about it, uh, LSU probably uh, pr five or six years prior to the consent decree uh, coming into effect, I think in 1980 and 81, had a black person in this office, which is the recruitment office of the university. So uh, I think, you know, it on one hand deserves some credit because before the institution was told to employ someone here. Actually, all the state institutions was told to employ a black person or in a black, historically black school, a white person. LSU had done so. And even prior to that time of having a full-time person in this office, they employed some of the uh, recruiters from the athletic department to help out also. So I think that, uh, uh, to answer your question, there had been a, a kind of a, a positive track record prior to the actual implementation of the consent decree. And once the consent decree w went into effect, the person who was here prior to the consent decree simply con went ahead and maintained or assumed, I should say, the responsibilities dictated under the consent decree. What does recruitment involve? At any more, it's a very uh, competitive, uh, uh, market-oriented type of activity. And, and it's a very simple 
premise upon which that is based. It's called the law of supply and demand. And I know when I went to school back, at, I graduated from high school in 68, uh, colleges had, there were more students than colleges needed. And there was no such thing as intensive recruitment. And about 1974, 75, and really right up until, and there's simply a chart that you can look at with, with populations of 18-year-old youth, uh, which dictates that there are fewer and fewer traditional college goers, that is, 18-year-old students. And as a result, colleges have had to be very, become very intense, very market re uh, recruitment oriented. And uh, recruitment then takes on the, uh, the, the image of, uh, most of the time, some very ethical kind, types of activities, but sometimes some very unethical type activities, which involve identification, uh, cultivation, uh, even some stimulation to the point of matriculation, okay, if I could put it in that sense. And our, our main goal, of course, is to contact a person who either self-inquires about LSU or any institution or to create an inquiry uh, out there to create a need, to create, to show a person why the LSU might be for them. And from that point of that inquiry, to move them along to a point of application, to a point of admission, to a point of financially assisting that student if they qualify or if they need financial assistance to a point of matriculation. How do you sell black high school students and their parents on LSU? Well, one of the good things about LSU is that it sells itself, uh, but that ain't enough, particularly if you want to, to, to dramatically increase numbers. I mean, we have maintained a incoming freshman class here at LSU of about 500 students or so the last five, six years. Uh, we want to do better. We're going to do better. I think the first thing we try to do is gain an audience with students who are considering college. And uh, beyond that, we try to show in a positive fashion why LSU might be a school they should consider. I think if a student considers LSU, uh, and if we do a good enough job at, 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 at telling them why they should consider LSU, they're going to make the application. Um, any student probably should choose two or three schools to apply to irregardless of where they're going to go. There's no need to put all your eggs in one basket because uh, it is a buyer's market. You need to see which school is going to do the best for you, either academically, financially, et cetera. And so you need to give yourself a chance to, to be considered at and for you to consider a variety of schools. Um, and if we are able then to aggressively and positively show a student why they should consider LSU, which we do through face-to-face uh, -face contacts, through direct mail, through uh, in sessions with faculty people, and uh, get them to the point of applying, and we can accept them because we're a public institution, uh, and then hopefully financially aid them. Uh, I think the institution sells itself. I mean, uh, LSU is our state university. It belongs to everybody in this state. Not black people, not white people, but everybody. And I think as a result, black students should be getting their fair share of that. Their taxpayers' dollars, their parents' tax, pay tax dollars go toward this institution, which has the best resources, the best facilities, probably some of the better faculty in the state, and every type of academic program you could possibly think of, with the exception, I think, of aeronautical engineering. Everything else we offer. We offer, we have two medical schools, a dental school, a veterinary college, there are only 27 vet schools in the country. We have one on our campus. We have a law school. We offer probably we offer more graduate programs, masters and PhDs than anybody. So, uh, and beyond that, I think that there is a great value of of dealing with the majority population. The real world is not all black and it ain't all white. And I think again, if you can begin to develop the skills, uh, and this isn't the only reason. Now, this is probably the last reason why anyone would want to consider to coming to LSU. But I do think it's a valid reason that you need to develop the social skills to be able to interact with all kinds of people white people, and uh, begin to negotiate those very intricate type and very subtle type of, of uh, negotiation that you have to do in the real world. I think if you can utilize LSU as a laboratory for that kind of thing as you pursue your own academic thing in accounting or computer science or whatever, you're going to come out that much more ahead in the ball game. Bryant grew up in Akron, Ohio and graduated from the College of Worcester in Worcester, Ohio. So what enables him to sell LSU? You know, I spent my first five years when I graduated from college with a large soap company. Uh, it's in Cincinnati, Ohio, as a matter of fact, Procter & Gamble. Okay. <clears throat> I started off as a sales rep and moved up to what they call a DFR, a district field rep, before I decided I really was kind of tired of doing that. 
And I guess the reason was I couldn't really be get myself psyched up to believe that a box of Tide cleaned any better than a box of Fab, okay? And I think whenever you find yourself in a situation of not believing in what you, the product that you're supposed to be out there pumping, then you need to change. <clears throat> well, I spent about six years working for a very small, predominantly white school in Ohio, one that I graduated from, as a matter of fact. And uh, I believed in it for a while until they kind of proved to me that they really weren't trying as hard to retain students to the point of graduation. Uh, your question is, how do I get pumped up about pushing LSU? Number one, I, was, I think as long as something is good, I don't have any problem with it. And I do think LSU is better than some other places. That's, it's, it's not important where. But I just think it is better, number one, because we are the state university. And we have tremendous facilities, excellent faculty, tremendous course selections. And I just think black students ought to be taking advantage of that to, to the same tune if they want to. Nobody can twist anybody's arm or put a gun in anybody's head. But I think if, if we present the facts in a positive, enthusiastic fashion, then students will take advantage of it. So uh, it's a simple matter of having a good product. And we got a good product. It's a quality education in this state. It's a, an expensive education as compared to private education. You can't beat the cost. You just can't beat it. And uh, if it's the kind of school you think you want to go to, then, hey, we just need to come together on it. So I don't have any problem. It's a, it's a good product. It's a good quality product. And if Bryant needs support to sell LSU, he can find it among black students already attending the university. I decided to come to LSU because I heard on a radio program that a white man said that black students choose to go to a black college because they don't have the ability to come to a white college and I came here to prove him wrong. Now what grade level are you now? I'm a sophomore. What do you think about the education you're getting here? I think it's one of the best that money could buy. Would you like to see more black students attend LSU? Yes. I think LSU is a good school. I think it represents our state well and I think that when I graduate, I'm in the MBA program here. When I graduate, I'll have a job. What do you think about the education you're getting here? I think it's excellent. I think it's top rate. I think LSU is one of the best schools in the South, to be perfectly honest. I transferred here from the University of New Orleans. And the main reason I chose to come to LSU is because uh, of the inability of a lot of other blacks to come to LSU. I think it's a good college. I think it offers a lot to blacks. And uh, I really felt LSU would be a good institution to finish my education in. Bryant says stricter admission requirements could present a problem, but none that black students can't overcome. What we hope are going to continue to be the new admission requirements will take place in 1988. And with the exception of just one uh, course of study, they mirror the new graduation high school requirements uh, for ninth graders this fall. And that high school ninth graders have to take four years of English, three years of math, uh, the social studies courses, one half a semester of computer science. We have gone one step further to require that students will have taken two years of foreign language in, a, in, a, in the same subject. That will create a problem. There are many school systems that will not be able to find language teachers. There will be school systems where students will choose not to take foreign language. And uh, I would be less than honest if I didn't think that those, those schools may be in the minority segment of our population versus the majority segment of our population. So uh, I do think that it is going to have some impact on the recruitment of black students uh, if we can't admit them based upon some other criteria. And there are some other criteria which we are looking at right now whereby if a student does not take the language or cannot take the language requirement, then we will still be able to admit them based upon some other criteria. So uh, uh, I think it's going to help in the long run, because it's going to improve the quality of education at LSU. We're going to demand, we're going to expect things of students. It's like anything else. If we don't expect much of you, we ain't going to get much out of you. Okay? And I think we've gone through a period of time where students haven't had very many expectations placed upon them. So we're, we've bitten that bullet. Hopefully we'll live with it, uh, and we'll see what happens. Well, there appears to be nothing but praise for LSU and its efforts. Here's wishing officials there the best success in achieving their goal. While some predominantly white colleges like LSU are trying to increase their black student enrollment, many historical black colleges are trying to do the same thing, as Genevieve Stewart found out in our one-to-one -one segment, which today features Dr. Norman Francis, president of Xavier University in New Orleans. Genevieve? 
Rob, Dr. Francis is qualified to address issues for all private institutions of higher learning. Until recently, Francis served as president of the Council of College Presidents. He also served on a presidential commission on excellence in education. As a result, Norman Francis has some strong words on secondary and higher education. We've heard a lot about the financial crises facing historically black colleges. What are the reasons? There are a number of reasons for it. I think the economy has been one of the biggest uh, contributing to that. And that has affected not only black colleges, but it's affected other private small colleges as well. Uh, many of the students whom we serve, and that's historically true, have come from family backgrounds of uh, below $10,000. Uh, many would be considered in the poverty line. And that's not to say that all are, but a sizable portion of those are. And that they are dependent upon whether they're mother and fathers or in many cases, uh, only the mother has a job. When the economy turned down and at the same time financial aid was not as available as it once was, uh, it caused a number of uh, students uh, to choose what we call public and state institutions. Therefore, we faced uh, a crisis like a lot of private colleges. But for us, it was uh, exacerbated because those youngsters were in families that were hardest hit by the economy. And then the financial aid uh, was cut back uh, and it was not enough to go around. Although we had youngsters who wanted to come to college, we just couldn't put the packages, finan the financial aid package to do that. What is the advantage of attending a black college? One of the advantages is you come to a small setting, you come to institutions that have had a sensitivity about what your prior background has been. With uh, institutions that have developed a system, one, to motivate you, to make demands on you and to hold high expectations and to say each day of your life that we believe you can learn. One of the problems that happens in elementary and secondary schools and of course in colleges is that a youngster can look on the face of a teacher and tell whether that teacher believes he or she can learn. And if that youngster believes that that teacher does not believe, says, well, well, I'll do the least I can. But if that teacher is saying, or that college is saying, look, I believe you can learn, I'm going to help you, I'm going to motivate you, and I'll give you what you need to do that, and the rest will be left to you. That's what we've done. And we have found that many young persons who would have been written off have found not only their life, but their careers at our institutions. And we base our statement not on coming to us because, quote, we are black. That's not the case at all. We base it on the fact, come to us because we're good and that we can offer you something that will help you in your careers. And we, we say the bottom line is, look at our graduates. Don't look at our buildings. Don't even look at the, uh, our teachers. Look at what the graduates and the proof of that pie is in the eating. And that's where we make our case. In recruiting students for predominantly black colleges, one still hears many of the old cliches. The job placement advantages are better when one graduates from a white college. The graduate school test exam scores are much better. Are black colleges producing second class graduates? No, let me tell you what's, uh, I'm so happy we got to that one. Uh, there has been a very recent study done by a ETS uh, staff member in collaboration with a funding from the Lilly Foundation, her name is Joan Baratz, who did a study of black, blacks on whites and blacks on black college campuses to answer that, quote, thought. Is a black student better off on a white college vis-a-vis -vis placement graduate school as against a black college? And the study says there is no substantial difference on the basis of whether it's a white or a black college. Meaning by that, that bottom line is the same. The difference, though, is that many of those black students who are at those black colleges would not have been admitted to the white college because the white college would not have identified their potential. Therefore, they wouldn't have gotten into college. But they went to a black college, and the black college made the difference. And in the bottom line, they were equal in terms of what their access was to graduate schools, uh, placement, and the like. Norman Francis served on the highly publicized Presidential Commission on Education, commonly known as the Nation at Risk, by the title of its report. Their findings were no surprise. They merely confirmed that the performance level of U.S. students is not keeping pace with world technology. 
What did astound many is the extent to which our schools are not adequately functioning, especially for lower income and inner city children of all races. But they're disadvantaged economically. They are many times in schools, high schools, that do not have the right equipment. They're overcrowded. Uh, they are not always uh, with the great benefit of adequately prepared teachers or a combination of all of these. And when that happens, then those students don't get a chance to have their full potential developed. They're not dumb, but they come from poor backgrounds educationally. In the nation at risk, which I had the pleasure of serving on, we found that in the last 10 years, both black and white students have not been challenged. Their curriculum uh, in the high schools were not such that would have prepared them for college nor for work. And I want to make that clear. Many people who heard our recommendation said, well, you are now saying that all students ought to have more math, more science, more English. Yes, we are. And we're saying that they ought not to have a choice as to what they want to study. And the reasons we said that was that in the last 10 years, the young people who chose what they wanted to study in high school came to college unprepared in some fundamental skills, but they also went to work unprepared. And we said that all students ought to have a core. It's that combination of things in the last decade in our high schools that have produced that small pool of academically prepared students. But what I get concerned about are those black and white students who have a potential that the elementary and secondary schools did not develop. And what do we do for them? Do we throw them, them on a stockpile somewhere and say, well, sorry, uh, we missed you. We're going to start with the next group. America can't afford that. And that was what the nation at risk said. We are at risk if we do not take those youngsters who have the potential and bring them to their fullest. The Nation at Risk Commission report further addressed the economic need for better education. In an industrialized nation, if minorities and white urban children are ill-educated, there is an overriding negative effect on the total economy. And what is frightening, really frightening for me, which America has not seen totally yet, is that the minority population in the country is growing. 23 of the largest cities in this nation have more than 50% of its high school enrollment black and brown. And that the birth rate among minorities, black and brown, is growing, while the birth rate for whites is going down. And unless we have institutions to serve that burgeoning population. We can talk about Social Security, we can talk about deficits, but all of us know that education is the key to the economy. And if that large cohort of young people who are coming up are not educated appropriately, we're going to suffer. And the way to do that is to educate more minorities. And right now, we are facing a crisis in the country and in Louisiana with respect to quality teachers and black teachers. Francis suggests some improvements which parents, high schools, and colleges can begin to implement now. The United States can ill afford poorly prepared students. A nation at risk could become a nation in jeopardy. Then the challenge that we have in institutions, all institutions, black, white, state, and private, is to identify those young people with potential as early as we can, work with high schools. If it's necessary, get them into summer programs. And then if they come to us, and in fact can be given aid before their freshman year and perhaps during their freshman year and make the movement that they should make, let's offer them the chance. That it's in no way suggesting that we should lower the standards that we would expect in graduations and or in college. What we do know though, that until those elementary and secondary schools do a more effective job, we cannot repeat high school in college. But what I'm saying in effect is that a collaboration between high schools and colleges could identify youngsters, encourage them in their high school during summertime, give them extra time, and then give them an opportunity in college. And I think when we do that, the brain drain will not be as severe as it is now. But more than that, we will expand the pool, we'll have a stronger brain power. And I, let me say to you, America is in uh, a deep struggle, not just internally, but a struggle globally. And the competitors are aggressive. We've seen it in the automobiles, and we're going to see it in every other thing. And unless we have the brain power broadly defined, black and white, we're going to suffer. And I'm hoping that we can take that potential, all of us working together, and see what we do have in young people, and not put them on stockpiles, not put them in the uh, category that they're high risk and not salvageable. Dr. Francis capsuled the concern for education by quoting the Nation at Risk report, which stated, 
if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. Recently, the Louisiana Association of Minority Criminal Justice Workers held its third annual conference in Baton Rouge. We close today's show by taking a look at the association and what it sees as the role of minorities in the criminal justice system. The Louisiana Association of Minority Criminal Justice Workers is a relatively new organization here in Louisiana. Its primary purpose is to enhance the economic status of minority criminal justice workers throughout the state. It really came to be uh, primarily as a result of my own experiences in the uh, criminal justice system in terms of, of um, promotional opportunities. Um, I've had practically every job that you can imagine, uh, from counselor all the way to administrator, and I found that uh, the top jobs in the correctional system, uh, and I'm, I'm in that part of the criminal justice system, were eluding me, but for no apparent reasons, okay? I had the necessary um, academic preparation, I had the experience, I had everything else that were necessary or criteria for promotion, but I was never able to, uh, to receive the same uh, consideration. So I felt that I couldn't do it on my own. I felt that there were others in the same situation, and I felt that the best way to address the situation was to organize. And Jones talked to us about his vision of the role of minorities in the criminal justice system. Some criminal justice agencies uh, have no problem with recruiting minorities as we define them in the, at the entry level. Uh, others have more difficulty. So what I'm really saying is when I say the role of minorities in criminal justice workers, I'm talking about us minorities being in a position of being in a role of authority and decision making. The keynote speaker at the association's third annual conference was Judge Israel Augustine of New Orleans, who also shared his thoughts on the role of minorities in the criminal justice system. You have expertise, most of you, in various areas of criminal justice. It's your field, and you've gone into it with perfection. But what we are hoping is that you each have a commitment. We ought to plan the programs that we work with. We ought to be determined to give it our very best, to be innovative, to be aggressive, to pursue knowledge and wisdom about the areas in which we work, to change the system. That's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. Next week on Folks, we'll be sharing some exciting excerpts from a speech given by Thomas Todd, former president of Operation Push. Be sure to join us then. Bye-bye. <laughs>